The ocean is a beautiful and thoroughly dangerous place. I learned this the year of my 21st birthday while serving aboard a frigate in the United States Navy. My ship and home, the USS Clifton Sprague, was a guided missile frigate. As Navy ships go, she was not very big, and these ships are being the smallest ships of the line in the fleet, measuring only 445 feet from stem to stern. She was a good ship though, and we had a commanding officer who intended to prove it. Due to his determination to show what a fine ship he had, I found the ship and myself steaming full speed into the teeth of a storm which raged off Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and the North Atlantic in the late fall of 88. The weather reports were saying that a tropical storm, particularly the tropical storm Keith, had not dissipated as expected but had pushed further north than any other storm that season. Late November was too late to be a weathering storm in the frigid North Atlantic. I thought of all the stories I had heard of how the Canadian Navy was supposed to welcome us to this multinational fleet NATO event that we were to attend. I had also heard that Canadian girls were friendly and the Canadian ships supposedly had beer pubs in them. But at that moment, I had no way to prove either of these things. Because instead of being with a warm woman or a bar stool, I instead found myself perched atop my frigid ship's bridge, standing a forward lookout watch in a driving sleet storm with 30 knot winds and heavy seas. What I was certain of was that I was wearing seven layers of clothing, most of it labeled extreme foul weather gear and yet I was still learning about what freezing to death means when it's just not an expression. Upon reviewing the newest weather advisories, the captain had decided it was best to remain at sea because a ship in port during a storm merely just gets beaten up against a pier until either the ship or the pier breaks. Since Canada routinely has lousy weather, they build sturdy piers, so we took our chances with the storm. Just after noon, the winds in the sea state began to really pick up, and soon we were in the undulating mode wherein one really gets to test the durability of their sea legs and their stomach. As I had walked through the ship from my birthing space towards my watch station earlier in the evening, I had paid little heed to the fact that sometimes my footfalls landed on the deck and sometimes on the bulkheads as the ship rocked beneath me. I also paid no notice to the ever-present sounds of the ship, the jet whine of the gas turbines, the thrum of the waves on the hull, the comforting hum of the generators or even the occasional ping from the sonar. My attention was on the smells from which one learns to pick up a great deal of information. I noted that sometime tomorrow the galley would be serving blueberry pie. The smell of the fuel oil samples from the oil lab seemed lardy enough for me to know that the fuel level in our tanks was much lower than it should be in such a storm. The smell of hot coffee from the mess decks filled my nostrils as I tanked up my cup and the combined aromas of paint, sweat, and cigarettes rounded out my card playing shipmate's contribution to this nautical boquette. I wall walked the rest of the ladders and passageways toward the bridge through the warm, welcoming, almost uterine interior of the ship. It was lit in soft red light to preserve the lookout's night vision. How I missed that warmth and light amid the dark, cold, wet misery of my bridge top watch station. My face crusted with ice around my nose and mouth. I swept my goggles off and spat into them hearing the sound and small snap as the spittle flash froze to the glass. I quickly tried to rub it before it froze to solid, and then disgustingly jammed the things on top of my head between my scalp and parka hood, where they might warm up a bit. I knew my vision wouldn't last long without them in the most inhospitable of environments. The sea roiled like a great gray blanket being shaken out onto an even greater bed. Usually, appearing solidly black at night, now every wavy surface seemed to be alive with foamy phosphorescence, so great was the sea state. 
The distance between the crest of a wave and its adjacent trough was easily 40 feet. I have never seen 40 foot seas before and I wish that I had saved that first time for a ship a bit more substantial than the tin canned I called home. I had only been going to sea with our navy for a little over a year at that point, but I was well aware that the floor of the North Atlantic was profusely littered with rotted and rusting monuments to mankind. As I pondered this, squinting through salt frozen lashes at the glowing and roaring wave tops, the sea looked and sounded to me like nothing more than a great grinder, ready to pulverize me, the ship, and end it all. It was in that moment that directly ahead of the ship, a brilliant stroke of lightning struck down into a wave. But this was not just any wave. Mariners call them rogue waves. This wave, larger than any around it, towered 50 feet higher than our main deck. This wave was a killer. Time stood still, framed in that bolt of lightning which seemed to claw its way down into the sea, forking and branching and turning that monstrous wave into a giant mountain of emerald and jade with its glowing striations. In an instant, its horrible beauty was gone, forever burned to my memory but lost to my retinas and replaced with the afterimage of blindness. I smelt the ozone from the lightning. I screamed, Rogue wave dead ahead! into my calm, but the bridge crew had seen it as well. Who could miss a giant glowing green mountain which was about to fall on you? I was blinded, but through the soles of my boots felt the sensation you get at the beach when an incoming wave pulls the water from under your sandy feet towards the sea. Except this was a lot bigger than a beach wave and I felt the deck drop out from under the sea, and my feet as millions of tons of water rushed to feed the behemoth. The ship practically fell into that wave, bow on, and as she plowed in, the wave broke over where I stood, three stories up from the main deck. If not for my safety strap, I would have been lost as over 100 feet of bow forward of the superstructure speared into that wave, and when the green water broke over the windbreak, it was like colliding with a wall. The hole rang from the impact. The ship lost almost all forward momentum, and for a moment, I felt she might be foundering. The bridge crew told me later on that the bridge windows were briefly totally submerged, and for that unnerving moment, they actually had to look up to see the surface. But then the ship began to groan and shudder along her whole length as she shouldered upwards, shedding countless tons of water from her decks. Ship and crew had survived. There were other waves that night, but I was positive that I knew which one had left the inch-wide cracks in the superstructure. I came to know that the ocean is very deadly, and its alluring beauty and magnetism are rivaled only by its brutality and mercilessness. More unusual than scary. I was working on a research vessel in the South Pacific in the mid-2000s. I was a part of the research crew, but worked closely with the ship's crew, since they were all contracted. It was a great group and an interesting project. Among the crew were two twins. I'll call them Kate and Kit. They were total sweethearts of the group and worked in the galley and as a steward. So we were doing bottom survey and had vehicles deployed. They take a while to get up and down, like about 10 hours if I remember correctly. We were just about to start a turn and head in the other direction. Think like mowing a lawn. And when we get word that one of the twins, Kate, is having a seizure, we did have a doctor on board, but obviously this is a pretty serious situation. The crew rallied to help and Kit filled us in that Kate had had seizures before, and that it was probably related to some relationship problems back home. Side note, they were originally from a country that has a cultural belief that seizures are not a medical condition, but rather a spirit type of experience. So Kate is having these crazy seizures that are lasting like 30 plus minutes. We're down in the lower berths, and Kit is assisting the doc, 
and one of the mates, who had a ton of practical first responder experience by the way. And by this time, we've started recovering the vehicle, 10 plus hours remember, and planning to head to the closest island, a small atoll which, which is just days southwest so that Kate can be medevaced, and I don't mean a chopper, just whatever plane we can get. The US Coast Guard wants nothing to do with us because we're too far from US shores. They are the Coast Guard, after all. Then Kit starts seizing also. We split them up so that we can handle them and brought one twin up to another common space. We arranged watch sections, basically to keep them from hurting themselves. They continue seizing throughout the recovery of the vehicles and most of the way. They were separated by two levels on a 170 foot ship, but would go in and out of consciousness at the same time. It was completely surreal, like twin feels I guess. We finally got this small port and got them to a hospital, which the doc declared unfit and worse on the ship. The twins got medevaced and if one of the engines on the plane didn't fail midair, causing a crazy landing. They get back to the states and the doctors back there can't find anything wrong with either of them. I was a navy sailor who went out to sea many times for weeks at a time. One of my jobs was being a lookout to spot boats, planes, things in the water or air pretty much and report it back to the ship. My lookout rotation could have been me standing watch during the day or night sometimes, both, and it was during the nights where I was pretty afraid, especially if you were at the back of the ship all alone. For anyone who hasn't been out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night should realize you see many more lights in the sky than you ever would in the city. And on Navy ships, they like to have very little lights on at night, so standing watch around 1am feels very alien sometimes. And during the nights, without a bright moon to help with your vision, you may as well be on a different planet. There was this one time I saw a bright green color moving in the water slowly. I didn't know what it was. My mind told me that maybe it's a USO or something else. Eventually, I was told it was just plankton, but it sure looked freaky to someone who wasn't aware of the glowing plankton produces. Another time, me and another guy were standing watch together and I decided to just look up during 2am and see what things I could come across the midnight sky. I would see meteors streak across the sky but a couple of times there were bright lights moving very slowly way out there. Perhaps a satellite after all but who knows. I stared for a good 20 minutes in the sky and encountered approximately 15 of these slow moving lights in different areas of the sky, perhaps many millions of miles apart. Either way, those were the few times I saw for myself how vast space really is and that there was so much more unknown out there than what humans have yet to discover. Have you guys ever been underwater in a relatively deep sea? We were basically hanging in nothingness and clearing a few nets and doing some repair work. Generally, divers have to take a light source with them, personal flashlights attached to the helmet, as well as larger flashlights to illuminate the surrounding area, just so we can see what we're working on, and to keep and use certain equipment, and so on. It was more or less 200 to 300 meters away. Ever stood on a plain land with little to no barrier? you should easily be able to see more than 200 meters. You may not see minute details like license plate numbers of a car that's say 700 meters away, but you can still make out a car or a bus or perhaps even a person going by at that range. We had a powerful flashlight and the sea water was relatively clear. Still it's foggy to some extent as you might know if you've ever gone deep underwater but we were nowhere near the bottom. And that's when we saw the most majestic and horrifying creature. Its tentacles still give me nightmares. Flashlight sort of expands as the distance increases so we would see a fairly large amount of what the squid's blood red body. Since 
spent my previous year in the Coast Guard up north of Norway. As you can imagine, the water is pretty cold up there, and I think at that time, it held around negative one Celsius. So the general rule was this, if you fall overboard, you are probably dead within a couple of minutes. So one day, I had to go out to do the daily man overboard boat routine check. As these boats are meant to be able to be used fast, they are sort of on the outside of the ship. So if you fall out of it, you fall into the sea. As this was the late winter there, there were several large blocks of ice floating around in the water, and as the boat was used as an icebreaker, the guys steering the ship didn't worry too much about hitting these blocks. Nonetheless, they made the boat shake a lot. Well, so when the boat rammed into an iceberg while I was in the boat, I was thrown to the side, barely managing to grab hold of a rope so that it did not fall. It still scares me to think about how close I was from being frozen to death. In the late 90s, I was in the Navy working on a ship. The USS Dixon was a submarine tender designed to replenish and repair submarines at sea. It turned out that this was dangerous and stupid to replenish and repair submarines at sea, so the ship spent 11 months of the year welded to the pier. Once a year it had to go to sea for at least 30 days, just so it could still be considered sea duty. For the people working on the ship, sea duty came with more pay and promotion opportunities. So we got to live and play in sunny San Diego most of the year, and then go to something like Fleet Week in San Francisco, or Seafair in Seattle. The summer before I came aboard, the shimp went to Alaska and did charity work in some town on the coast. On the way back from this stop, they headed fairly far out to sea. Rather than hugging the coast as usual, well, a bad storm came up and the ship was getting tossed around pretty good. A little about the layout of the ship in this order. The ship was capable of repairing anything up to and including a nuclear reactor, and had a huge machine shop. The machine shop was in the middle of the ship and had huge doors that were normally bolted shut. Once a year or so, they would open the doors to make sure they still worked, grease the seals and bolt them shut again. Sometimes they would open the doors to bring in large items, but never while at sea. The machine shop was fully equipped with every possible type of machine tool and supplies and materials locked away in cages around the edges. When the storm hit the ship, the old tub got to rocking and rolling. A lot. In fact, the storm was so bad that people were getting injured from falling. Many people were seasick, which was okay with the kitchen, because all they could make were sandwiches and Kool-Aid at this point. The storm continued to build, and finally, the chief engineer called up to the captain to tell him some devastating news. He could not keep the boilers lit. The ship was about to go dead in the water. The fuel oil was sloshing so much in the burners that it was smothering itself. This meant that the ship would be at the mercy of the sea, with no way of steering into the waves. They would likely take a number of waves full on sideways. And that's exactly what happened. The ship went on emergency power, a huge generator driven by a 10-cylinder Caterpillar diesel engine and lost all headway. The waves were pounding the side of the ship, and she was rolling, rolling beyond what her designers intended. A crane on the main deck fell off the boat completely. They didn't find this out until later though, with the waves pounding the sides of the ship. The walls would alternate as the floor, in an unpredictable pattern. If the people aboard were miserable before, they were triple miserable now. Only a few hardy souls were able to function at all. The corpsmen were out of the normal pain and anti-nausea drugs and were using morphine stylets from the Korean War. They were starting IVs while they were on IVs themselves. Then everyone heard a disquieting noise, or noises actually. It sounded like something was crashing into the ship, something besides water. Investigating, a damage control team found a hellish nightmare in the machine shop. The large doors had begun leaking, and there was a few inches of water sloshing back and forth. 
and this large space with the ship rocking side to side and front to back. The waves inside the large area were occasionally several feet high. Worse, some of the large metal billets had broken through the supply cages and were now crashing back and forth, smashing into the side of the ship with tremendous force like a battering ram. Some of the machine tools had integral electrical transformers, and these had been broken open, spilling their insulating oil. That oil was also sloshing about liberally with the seawater. This made the situation even more dangerous for the damage control team, but they had to act. The ship was in mortal danger. The brave men and women, and with about 1,600 sailors aboard, set about lassoing the billets, holding them in place between rolls and crashing inside and out, and welding them to the metal deck and uprights wherever they could. Some had to go below the machine shop to watch and put out fires from the welding. Others made for the giant doors and tried to secure them so that no more water would come into the ship. Eventually, they finished the dangerous task, not without injury, but without loss of life. The ship was safe, for now. But then the lights went out, and the diesel fuel for the emergency generator was contaminated by water, and the generator was out of action. In fact, the huge 10-cylinder engine was ruined. Now the ship was truly dead in the water, as the storm raged. Many hours in the storm continued, and the main engines were thankfully relit. No one had been killed, but the injuries were many and some were very severe. The ship limped back to a safe port. After that trip, the ship stayed close to the coast for the rest of its life. It's now been used as a target and sunk, possibly with the very torpedoes it used to carry. On a 41-foot sailboat in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, with about seven other men, Doing a shakedown slash test cruise, planned to be out for roughly 12 hours. Mid-1980s, not as reliable weather prediction resources. We get caught in a tropical storm, winds gusting into the 50 mile an hour range. Just the short of a weak hurricane. We had just barely rigged storm hossers and storm sails because... The one fellow on board who was the best sailor sensed the storm was almost on us. Otherwise, we would have died. During the storm itself, I expected to die at any given time. For what seemed like 15 minutes, we were in a maelstrom. No visibility, but then it passed and we would live. This was at about 3 p.m. and although there was cloud coverage, of course, the ambient light was such that you could see two miles or so in any direction. If you're familiar with the sea, you know that such storms, particularly in shallower depths near land masses, dredge a lot of things on the sea floor. We're all on deck, working lines, checking damage, etc., and the bay around us is choppy and churning and foaming. Old-timey sailors often use the saying, the sea is confused. I look about 15 feet off the starboard side, and something swims to the surface, breaks the surface, looks at us, and then submerges again. It was like a thin man, with a humanoid shape, arms articulated like a man, a human head, but its skin was covered in scales like a snake. It looked at us, blinked its weird heavy-lidded eyes, then dove back under. So maybe you need to know a few things about me at the moment. No drugs, no alcohol, no injuries. I was elated because I was glad to be alive, but my senses in that situation were sharpened, not dulled. I had at the time about six years of experience on ships and other fishing boats and had seen squid, octopi, flying fish, sharks, skates, etc. all around the world. I was not the type of guy to see a patch of seaweed and call it a sea monster. I made an instinct decision that I was not going to say anything. Well, what could I say? I just saw a strange creature take my word for it. The men on this boat were all mechanics and engineers and professionals. Why get a reputation as a flake? 
At the time, it was important for each of us to get D skipper or OOD qualifications, and saying something like that would be frowned upon heavily. As I stood there in my life vest, soaking wet, hooked onto the steel lifeline, glad to be alive, one of the other sailors, a USN captain by an anonymous name, with over 30 years of experience in the surface navy, piped up and said, I just saw a brown thing pop up on the surface. It looked like a lizard man with a scaly face. It blinked at us with these big eyes and then went back under. Yeah, I saw it too, I said. No one else said they had seen it. Then we sailed back to the pier later that day and never spoke of it again.